Welcome to the Alphagenics podcast, where every week we talk about health, well-being, biohacking, longevity, and of course, men's health. And I'm delighted to introduce the queen of men's health this week, Ali Gilbert. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Ross. That, that, by the way, that nickname was given to me. It's not a self-proclaimed <laughs> nickname, <laughs> queen of men's health. So just letting everybody know I'm not so highly thinking of myself that I call myself that. So I, I forget who who did that. I think it was somebody on a podcast who was like, I think you're like the queen of men's health. And I was like, all right, I'm going to roll with that. And we'll do yeah, you're like, that. That sounds good. I think I can use that. It's cool. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So how, how did you get involved in men's health, though? Because you could help anyone in your line of work as a, as a, as a PT. Why why men? Um. So it's funny because... The, the short, long version, basically, I went to school for exercise science. And everyone who majors in exercise science or strength conditioning wants to train athletes. That's like everyone's thing. Cool. There's like a bajillion ways to do that. And over here, strength and conditioning did not really pay a whole lot. And my internship was at the college level or university level. And it literally, you, you make nothing for working like 16 hours a day. And although it's very, you know, gratifying, I was like, well, I still have to kind of pay bills. And the town I grew up in, in Connecticut had, um, a gym that I ended up working at that trained athletes and NFL and, uh, American football and all that. Um, and I was like, cool, this is fun. And that actually closed within a year. So I was like, great. So I went to a commercial gym and worked as a trainer there. And I started getting a lot of guys that played golf. And I was like, all right, well, this is a sport I'm not really familiar with. I played, we call it soccer. You guys call it football <laughs> at, yeah. in college. So that was my sport. And I was like, well, golf seems fun. Let me learn about it. And I started taking lessons with local golf pros and traded them for training. And there's a certification for golf fitness. So I kind of just went all in on that because our town had nine golf clubs. It was a very wealthy town. Pretty much everyone played golf. So all my clients were guys because guys sought out golf fitness. Women didn't really care. Yeah. So quickly I realized, all right, well, I'm dealing with all guys. Um, I pretty much am an athlete and a tomboy. And so I get along with them very easily. And knowing how men never go to the doctor, a lot of them were asking me questions related to hormones and nutrition and all this stuff. And I was like, hmm, nobody's really like covered this for men. Like there's tons of stuff on women's health and like, yeah. you know, women's hormone replacement is so socially accepted. I was like, wow. And my business coach at the time was like, Ali, just start posting about men's hormones only. Don't talk about women. Let's see where that takes you. And that was back in like 2011, 2012. So it was through golf fitness that landed me working with mostly guys. And that became kind of my niche. So I learned as much as I could. I attended medical conferences. Mm -hmm. I had spoken at medical conferences. I just learned uh, doctors and their processes and everything I could about men and their their uh, hormones and everything. And here we are. And so everyone's like, cool, if I want to learn about TRT or testosterone, I'll go to you. I'm like, awesome. So I just missed my medical degree. That's all. But I have <laughs> awesome practitioners in every country. You know, UK is very difficult, as you know. Yeah. Um Australia, Eastern Europe, and then mostly the US. So I work with clients from all over and I do um, online coaching for fitness and nutrition. And yep. if men need TRT or whatever related to medical stuff, I have people to refer them to. Amazing. And one of your slogans is you help men get jacked, which <laughs> um, I love that because in England, you would say, hi, my name's Ali Gilbert, and I help men achieve the physique they want. And, and <laughs> you're like, we're going to help men get jacked. <laughs> I think that's absolutely brilliant. But um, is that what's the you know what's the secret? Do you have to tap in and really discover what motivates them, or is it all diet, exercise? What's your what's your secret sauce? So 
the demographic I tend to deal with um, are guys around 25, 30% body fat or lower, uh, probably more in like the 2025. And, and it's guys who have usually done some form of exercise their whole life, or they've done what most women do, which is chronically under eat, over train. So we're always the one that get pegged as like crazy and we rely on the scale and everything, but guys do it so much. Oh my God. Yeah. They literally freak out about the scale. And the funny thing is like, you guys will be like, Oh, that, that makes no sense. But over in the U S I have them weigh themselves in kilos so that they don't do the math and they don't know what they weigh. So <laughs> it's it be like you guys weighing yourselves in pounds, but it's bigger numbers. So it might be scary. I'm yeah. like, just weigh yourself in kilos and then log it for me and all that. So when, when it comes to getting them to look the way they want, and I think every man might resonate with this, guys think they have to lose all this body fat and they may have to lose some, but when they do lean out, then they're like, oh, I'm too small. I'm skinny ripped um, or skinny fat. Like, I don't want to look like this. I don't have enough muscle. So yeah. I'm like, okay, well, are you willing to eat? And get through that phase where you might feel fluffy, but it's not all this gobs of fat to get through to the other side because building muscle takes so much time. Losing body fat is easy. It's a lot quicker, but yeah. building muscle is like, I mean, it's a year, a year, if not years, I mean, 10 years into it, people start to really look the way they want. And I'm not going to say, oh, this is a 10 year process. But you have to give at least a year for somebody like me to coach you so that we can work our way through increasing calories, getting your body to a point where it can actually respond again. And then if we go through a diet phase, you're not dieting on like 1800 calories, which is this magic man number. I don't know where this came from, but literally like every guy. When they under eat, they come and I, I have them log their food and I'm like, yo, you're eating like 1850. Like why? Women eat like 1200 guys eat 1850. I don't know where this number comes from, but yeah. then it becomes this perpetual cycle of increasing calories and decreasing a little bit, increasing, decreasing a little bit. It's just getting them through the part where they think they have to constantly cut calories or add more exercise on top of it, where it's flipping their beliefs and then being consistent. So it, it's not necessarily magic, but I think my approach is ass backwards from like what media tells everyone to do. Cause they'll say, well, you know, lift six days a week, do cardio two hours a day. You got to cut calories in order to lose weight, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hold up. If we can lift like four days a week. We can increase calories. And they're yeah. all like, what? but it works yeah. <laughs> almost, almost the opposite but more, more pragmatic as well like it's going to take time yeah but this is what we're going to do Let, let's go on a journey together um you mentioned something really interesting in there which was about guys you know getting on the scales and, and checking themselves regularly that historically i think there was always a lot of pressure on women to look a certain way but now with you know reality tv and social media i think men are feeling just as much pressure um, yep. to have a six pack or to look a certain way. And it's, I think it's causing a lot of people then to go out and self-administer TRT and take other steroids as well. Do you come across that? Oh my God. Yeah. And it, it's more the, the comparison trap, I think affects all of us, affects all of us. Like I find myself even like looking at, you know, I love Dana Lynn Bailey, who's a, she was a physique competitor over here and she, she's awesome. And I just compare myself and I'm like, I can't compare myself to other people. And I think guys will see on social media what these other guys look like. And it's more the expectation management that I have to deal with. I had a guy last night on a console and, and he was upset because he was eight weeks into his fitness you know, journey and upset that he didn't have results. And I'm like, OK, so <laughs> instead of yelling at him for it's only been eight weeks, I was like, what? results are you expecting and what does progress mean to you because it can mean many different things and he was describing like a recomp which is basically dropping body fat adding muscle at the same time which is possible but not in two months 
And so I had to really explain to him if he's losing a dramatic amount of weight very quickly, then he's more prone to losing muscle mass. And two months is nothing. I mean, I tell people minimum, minimum three months, like just to even start to maybe feel and look different. But even mm -hmm. then, like really look at it for a year. And the people that we see on Instagram, they're reusing photos they did in photo shoots or they're using Photoshop or like filters and stuff like that. And it, it's having to understand that's what they do. I'm not, I'm not shaming anybody. I love filters. I use photos from photo shoots because that's why we do them. Yeah. But understand that this was a point in time that is not sustainable year round. So you can absolutely have abs year round if you want. What will it take you to get there? Don't worry about what it took this other guy to get there. But let's worry about you and your history and what you've been through and what you're doing now. But I think overall getting somebody to understand that it's going to take probably a lot longer than we want it to or think it will is the underlying factor. And, and they disappear quickly too. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. And also it's like the dirty bulk. Guys think like if they build, then they have to look sloppy. And that's so not the case. And I'm like, I love that one of my guys posted his, the end of his bulk. We just started a cut and he, he, uh, it was like six, seven months, I can't remember, where he he gave me the green light. He relinqu relinquished all control to me. And he was like, I will gain however much you think is necessary. And he's a big dude. He's 6'3", he's like 210 at the end of his cut. So throughout the winter, he gained like 30 pounds or something, but it was symmetrical. And his abs still had some indentation, but they're supposed to blur out. Yeah. And now... We'll see what he looks like. But he's like, I felt good in clothes. Like I still wear a, sl a sleeveless shirt. I didn't feel embarrassed because there's a way to do it strategically that doesn't make you turn into like what you think you're going to turn into, which is like Jabba the Hutt or something. So <laughs> yeah. and then that guys will do that because they'll eat more than they think they need to. Um, and then all of a sudden they're like, I'm too fat. And then they crash diet it off and then they're back to where they started. You kind of just described me there a little bit, Ali. Yeah. Uh, see, I I, yeah. <laughs> Every time I speak in person, like I do a live lecture, the guys in the audience are like. Yeah. yeah you, <laughs> as you were talking, I was like, shall I admit this or not? Like, yeah. No, okay, you absolutely I mean, should because more guys go through this than are willing to talk about. And that's the main thing with men is men don't really talk about these things or these feelings and stuff, but you guys all go through it. Yeah. And, and that's what we do at Alpha Genics. You know, we're encouraging men to talk, whether it's about, um, yeah, body body image, whether it's about, you know, our weight, whether it's about our relationships, whether it's about erectile function. And you've got a really cool way of putting that. You, you've got normalized boner talk. Which, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that. Where did that come from? Oh, God. I think it was the guys at Barbell Shrugged um, on their podcast. They were like, you normalize boner talk. And I was like, I'm going to put that in my IG profile because it's just a way of diffusing the awkward nature of talking about stuff like this. And I'm sure you see it every day where no matter how old they are, if they're dealing with some sort of sexual dysfunction, they feel like they're alone, but they're really not. And yeah. so I try That's to get that message across. I'm like, dude, like you can be 29 and dealing with this. You're not alone. Like it, yeah. it's not normal, but it's really common. And they're like, oh, like they don't think that, you know, mm -hmm. so they think something's wrong with them or they're just so isolated and alone in, in this. And I'm like, no, you're really not. So I'll just go right at it and talk about it. But I bring humor so that it doesn't make them feel uncomfortable. So yeah. that, that's where that came from. But I think that was a few years ago. The guys were like, yeah, you normalize it. I'm like, cool. We're going to roll with that. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. I mean, and um, a couple of things in there. I mean, I, I took TRT for nearly nine years and and didn't tell anybody like medically mm. prescribed to you know trt and didn't even really talk about it with my wife although she knew and then it was only 18 months ago where i thought why don't i tell anyone you know it, it, at, is it because it doesn't come up or is it actually because it feels somewhat emasculating to admit you need something extra to kind of make you a man 
And that was really, really eye opening. And that's when we had the idea to start Alphagenics and, and spread the message. But to go back to your normalizing boner talk as well, it's erectile dysfunction s- sounds medically weak yeah. in, a man, in a man's head. It's like, oh my God, that's a medical problem. It's a, it's a, rec- it's a rectile and it's dysfunctioning. It's weakness. It's, it's not working. So normalizing boner talk sounds masculine. It, it <laughs> sounds like I want to talk about that. That that's way that's way cooler. So yeah, I love that. I, I, we, again, we don't really have a English equivalent of that, but I'm gonna. Think <laughs> <of it today. laughs> you guys are getting there. I remember all all the the guys I played soccer with from the UK. I was like, you know, you it, it's okay to laugh about things like this, and I've spoken in the UK. And sometimes like they'll either sit there and like, like they're about to crack up or they'll just be like, oh my God, she just said like, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, it's crazy word. And it's so funny. So I mean, I love you guys, but yeah, that that's, I, I'm kind of very like, my candor is just, it is what it is. Um, and I use words that maybe other people would find inappropriate, but like you said, you know, g- guys don't want to seem like they're weak or they don't want to feel like you know relying on something and that that's the thing with trt is a lot of them won't want to go on because they don't want to rely on this exogenous substance or they don't Mm -hmm. want to succumb or feel like they're defeated and that's where you know the the differences between men and women whereas women are like oh this is going to make me feel better i'm going to go do this asap and guys are like i don't need that i want to try and do it naturally first all for that totally but if you get to the point where you still don't feel good, you know, it's okay to go on this. Like, yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's the message we, we put out there as well. It's, you know, if, you, if your levels are at a certain level, then you can do this naturally. You know, you, you do the right exercise, make the right dietary choices, get quality sleep, you know, meditate, look after your mental health. But actually when you go solo, you you've got to get help and it's the only way you're going to get back into an optimal range um so it's great to hear you talk about you know that that as well and and you're adding in everything that you do from that holistic side but sometimes you just need that extra help yeah and i mean there's there's pros and cons to taking that approach many people can interpret me as being very pro trt which i am but it's specifically from what we discussed to, to make it so it's not scary for guys, because as you know, there's all these myths and scary fear mongering, you know, things about it. And I'm just like, let's talk about this normally. And if you have to go on it, you have to go on it, but that's not saying you shouldn't address all of your lifestyle stuff as well. So that has to happen anyway. Yeah. So they, yeah. a lot, a lot of people, there is that group that thinks it's like the panacea of earth and they think it'll solve all their problems. And I mean, I have guys asking me now, like every time I post a, a transformation of a client, they're like, so what is he on aside from TRT? And I'm like, why does he have to be on something else? Or if he's not on TRT, oh, what is his protocol? And I'm like, why does everybody equate any type of progress with having to take something let's define testosterone replacement is literally like replacing what you should produce. It's not going on steroids. Like nobody's cheating. If anything, it helps guys recover so that you can lift more and recover from training and eat better and all that stuff. But like you don't turn into the Hulk and dude, if I loaded somebody up with every single anabolic agent on the planet, you still have to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not magic. Yeah, like yeah. trust me, there's a lot of people that wish it were magic, but that whole like actually put in the work thing, like it still applies. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we get them as well, you know. When we, we say that that those exact words, we say, look, TRT is amazing. It can transform your life, but it's not magic. You've still got to be putting in the work. You, you've got to make good lifestyle choices. Mm-hmm. Um, and not everybody wants to, you know, some people are just looking for a magic pill, aren't they? Yeah, totally. And hitting that home as well, because it isn't magic sauce. And there are like, I'm sure you've experienced, there's a very small percentage of men that don't necessarily react to it, like in a good way, initially, until they find the right protocol for them and all of that stuff. So 
there's guys that can be deterred from it just from that alone. And it yeah. drives them deeper into a hole of less motivation and stuff like that. Cause they're like, well, TRT doesn't work for me. So, and it's like, well, slow down. You know, we still have to clean up a lot of the stuff that, you know, you're dealing with because it does solve a lot of things for guys, but it doesn't mm. solve everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're quite right. You get into a, a negative spiral. Um, didn't work. Therefore I'm going to, not go to the gym and then my sleep's going to be worse so therefore I'm going to make terrible food choices and then that affects my mood and then my weight goes up I aromatase any testosterone I do after estrogen which affects my erections and it goes around and around and around and around, and around. Um, but the right TRT protocol can interject and create this circle where you come back up which yeah. is amazing when you see that happen totally um, so one of the first times I, I sort of came across you was last year and you were running your silverback summit yes and tell us about that because that sounded really cool it's going to happen again this year isn't it it is yeah so my logo is a gorilla and um there is a story to that because usually when talking about men or men's health or you know a guy's penis people would use the eggplant emoji and i just thought that that was very unfair to describe a guy so I was like, the silverback gorilla is way cooler. I would think that guys would aspire to be more like the physique of a gorilla versus a purple vegetable. And that's kind of like one of my kickoff stories in the lecture because it makes people laugh and everything. So I had silverback gorilla drawn and that's where the silverback summit came from because that's my logo. And I saw that like after 2020, the communities on Facebook and everything were growing and there's so much discuss discussion surrounding testosterone replacement and fitness and nutrition. And I was like, why don't we do something in person where everybody can actually meet each other and you guys can discuss stuff in the same room. And mm -hmm. so I made it a men's only event for that reason, because if you add like too much feminine energy, guys aren't really going to talk about stuff. So I did have female practitioners come, but otherwise it was all dudes. And I had it in Florida where I had the TRT practitioners that I knew and um, were uh, correlated with in the U.S. speaking. I had a cardiologist who talked about like the actual truth about TRT and, and cardiovascular health, but also statins and cholesterol I had a urologist talking about uh, estrogen and prostate cancer. I had some other practitioners talking about thyroid and like TRT 101. Um, I talked about fitness. I had another one of my guys talking about fitness and nutrition. So we had pretty much two different types of talks like fitness and medical. And mm -hmm. then we also had a practical gym session where we took people through stuff. I really wasn't sure who would come. Um, the funny thing was that it attracted a lot more medical practitioners than I was really anticipating, which I thought was cool. And they're yeah. like, Hey, can I speak? Hey, like, what is this? You know, cause in the United States, if you, um, if you, if you allow for credits, like practitioners need credits for education throughout the year for their license, yeah. getting, getting credits regulates and restricts what you can talk about. And so we had it pretty much open and a lot of people enjoyed the fact that you could just talk about anything. So you could talk about PEDs, you could talk about, you know, TRT protocols that maybe other places don't really follow stuff like that. Yeah. And it was great where we had all these guys in a room and I was like, will they talk to each other? Will they make friends? Will they go back to their room and just hide? But everyone was like BFFs by the end of the weekend. And I think it gained a lot of traction. And now that I understand what they want and what we can do, like we can make it medical and fitness. We don't have to make it like this umbrella to apply to everybody because it's hard to make medical stuff basic and then not have the medical practitioners actually want to, you know, listen to that. Yeah. So we're going to make it a lot bigger. I'm going to have it in Austin, Texas in November, November 10, 11. So we did have some international practitioners come last year. So if you guys want to, I'll be announcing it within the next few months. Um, but I'm doing a virtual one first. Actually, we announced that tomorrow and that will occur in May. And that's going to be free to attend 
for the reason to invite everybody into my world. So, Excellent. yeah. And, uh, so, so what, what, how can, how can someone find you then? Is it on Instagram or e uh, website? What's the best place? Instagram's probably the best. The Ali Gilbert, A L I. Um, most of my content's posted there. So if they slide in the DMs, you can talk to me. Um, and then silverbacksummit.com is last year's site has the recordings from last year. If you guys want to buy that. Um, but we will be pushing more of the newer stuff on there eventually. But I literally tomorrow on, on Instagram, we'll be talking about the virtual summit in May, which will be free. You can buy the recordings. I'm going to have, I don't even know how many speakers we have, but it's a lot. <laughs> but it'll be good. Yeah. And I've seen, I've seen on Instagram, you've been flying around lately around the, around the U S and, doing some work with some other practitioners. What have you been, what have you been up to? So Dr. Eric Serrano, who's pretty well known over here. He's also my personal doctor. Um, I just enjoy his company. So I went and hung out with him for like a week and he, he uh, speaks at a conference here called Swiss. So I've learned so much from him and, and he's in the fitness and the medical world. So he's somebody that's kind of like a unicorn where he just knows a lot about both industries so that was really fun. And next, not next week, next month, I'm going to go up to uh, New York, New Jersey. One of my providers, Gil Tal, owns a clinic up there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to visit him. So I kind of just, I have to fly to visit my friends because I don't have a lot of local friends. So I have to go elsewhere. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it, 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 it's just seminars and you know, there's a ton of different speaking engagements um, this year. And I'm just talking about pretty much everything we discussed today. And yeah. if it's to fitness professionals, then I give them my approach to coaching men and kind of like the future of coaching men. Yeah. Why, why do you think, you just got me thinking there, why do you think men find it so hard to talk? Why, why, why don't we open up? I think because men are conditioned that that's weak and being vulnerable is weak and they have to show strength. Mm -hmm. um, and if they start bringing that up, it makes them look less than. And I think that's pretty much why, like if they cry or if they show emotion. And I think that's also why it's helpful or they feel maybe more comfortable talking to me because I'm a female you're not going to talk about it in the locker room with guys and stuff like this. So I'm also not their partner who's pushing them to go to the doctor, but I'm a female that recognizes, Hey, this is actually pretty common. You're not alone. Um, let's talk about it. And it helps. And, and I think also mental health has gained a lot of uh, exposure in recent years, especially with the pandemic and everybody stressed out, not talking to each other and mm -hmm. social media and everything like, you can zoom all day, but still when you're in person, that's why live events are so like awesome. I yeah. personally thrive because I just love seeing people and just making new friends. And like, I joke that I have to fly to my friends, but I literally like, that's where I see all my best friends is at seminars. Cause I've met them all there. And I think part of having that community is something that guys have been starved of. And so Silverback helped provide that because I was like, do you guys even want community? Like, is that something? And, and they loved it. And I was yeah. like, well, shit, like it proves that that's something they're comfortable with. Because if you think about it, because I was I was discussing this with some of my male followers, like they don't really have uh, their bros. So most guys maybe have one or two friends they're close with, but it's not like the rat pack of like older days where you'd have like six to eight dudes that you were super close with in the neighborhood and you guys did everything together. That's not as apparent anymore. And I didn't realize that. I just thought guys all had like their groups of dudes, but apparently not as much. Yeah, I think it, it, it's definitely true. And then, and the people you do hang out with as well, they might not be quite ready for you to be vulnerable and, and unload your issues so that you kind of, running i guess the the risk of being ridiculed so providing a community 
whether live live events or you know, online communities or wherever it might be, I think is really powerful because it gives an outlet. Because I think it, it is important for us to share, obviously, but you have to share at the right time when appropriate. Because if you if you opened up to your boss, but your boss didn't want to hear that, maybe you get sacked, you know, or yeah. you open up, even your wife, maybe you open up to your wife or your partner, and perhaps they're not ready. They haven't done work on work, work on themselves and they don't want that responsibility. Maybe the relationship breaks down. So it's not quite as easy as men just need to talk, I don't think. No, and, and the fact that you brought that up, I mean, I I think I was posting I posted something, but um when when you want to make a change in your life that's positive, there's going to be people who are triggered. And this had to do with lifestyle and physique and all of that, because if if you're say overweight and you decide I want to change my life around, I want to look a certain way, people around you are going to make you feel weird, make you feel bad. Like if you go out in social situations, they're going to be like, ah, dude, you could have one drink. Come on, you can eat this. Like if you decide to spend free time in the gym and you don't want to go out drinking anymore, then that's weird. And so I've seen this transpire. I did a poll on my Instagram. I said, I asked people, have you lost a friend or family member relationship due to a positive lifestyle change? 90% 90% said yes. And I was yeah. like, there you go. This this shouldn't be, but there's always going to be somebody triggered because you're doing what they can't bring themselves to do. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I haven't drank alcohol since 2021. And um, one of my uh, one of my one of my best friends, he was like, you're boring. I don't want to go out with you anymore. Uh, and now, funnily enough, later, you know, two years later, he stopped too. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, believe it I sleep so much better it's brilliant um but there was that whole period where it was tongue-in-cheek but you know he was like you're boring I don't want to go out with you um and now things are starting to change so it is funny but it happens and you know you get the you get the other friends that are going just one maybe maybe a shot Maybe (laughs) shot maybe a short drink and you know it's because it makes them feel better if you're doing it too Totally. Cause then they're, they're not as uncomfortable. And I used to go out all the time and not drink, you know, but people said the same thing, like, Oh, you're boring or whatever. And I'm like, cool. You know, I, I don't think I drank. I drank in October, no November, but for my photo shoot <laughs> the next day. So I drank to dry out. So I didn't drink like socially <laughs> with alcohol. Okay. I think I actually, the last time I was drunk was at our wedding and my husband too. I, well, he, he's drank a little bit more before, but yeah, that, that's really the last time that I like drank, drank, you know, you drank to dry out. I don't even oh, know. Oh yeah. Cause alcohol is super dehydrating. Okay. So I, it was like two o'clock in the afternoon and I was drinking, um, vodka <laughs> straight and then the next day I had to do it the, the day before because like I can't handle it at night because then I won't sleep at all. And then obviously I don't want to be like drinking and driving to the gym. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it has this um, dehydrating effect where your skin will look tighter. And so the lines will show. And this only happens if you're really lean. Guys, don't think like, oh, I'm going to start drinking to lean out like that yeah. doesn't work that way. <laughs> That's that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, I forget that I have to explain that sometimes. I'm like, oh yeah, I drank for my photo shoot, and people are like, "What does that mean?" I'm yeah, like, yeah, oh, exactly. yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> like that's weird. Be, yeah, it needs to be more relaxed, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Ali, I loved chatting to you today. If you had, if you could give one piece of advice to anybody listening, perhaps they're they know or they would like to get fitter, they would like to look a different way. What one thing can you say to encourage them to make that difficult lifestyle choice? Oh, I I would say um, whatever you do, as insurmountable as it seems, coming out the other side, you're going to feel 10 times better. And when you do it the right way, which means if you approach it as this is something for the rest of your life, not a start and end point, 
literally the results will be that much better because it'll be something that you can sustain forever and it doesn't have to be this deprive and binge cycle. And mm -hmm. I think that was like three things. I'm sorry, but. No, no, that, that was good. It was a hard question. <laughs> yeah, it is a hard question because I, I think a lot of people are just like, they, they think what bodybuilders do is eat chicken and rice and, you know, give up everything about their life that they think is fun. And you and I may not drink, but I have guys that drink maybe once a week or a couple times a month. You can still do that. So again, making a change does not require giving up everything about you and everything that you love, but it might mean changing what you feel you're about and having a new identity, which isn't a bad thing always. So it's kind of just taking inventory of where are you in your life? Could making these changes make you more successful and more confident? Because there is a correlation between feeling jacked and lean and making more money and being more successful in business. It does carry over. And if you haven't gotten your labs done, you know, go to Alphagenics, get your labs done, see where you are so that you know where you stand so that you can work on that. And you have kind of some data points because men do well with structure. If they have something to work on and instruction, then they're more likely to follow through with it. Yeah, yeah, a bit more, a bit more logical. So if you have those baseline numbers, you can keep coming back to it and building on it. Exactly. Excellent, Ali. Well, what an absolute pleasure to to chat to you. So we can find you on Instagram, the Al, Ali Gilbert dot yep. um, com. It's been a pleasure, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>